Hello, everyone. I'm Athena Negrescu, and today I am here with Andy Roman. He is my favorite uh, psychotherapist. He worked at the Hippocrates Health Institute for 31 years, I think. Andy, no? <laughs> 31 no. years. That's amazing. Yes, uh, and he's an author. He has uh, two books. I know that you have a new book. Andy, thank you for being here. Tell me more about you, what you do, and tell me about your new, new book, please. Well, um, I work here at the Hippocrates Wellness in West Palm Beach, Florida, as a psychotherapist. So that means that the guests who come here not only get treated physically by eating a really clean diet, they not only get treated by receiving body work and electromagnetic machines and all that kind of good stuff and exercise, but they also get psychological counseling. And I do it in the form of one-on-one -on -one work, couples work, and we also have a healing circle, which is group work. And uh, for some people, it really makes a, a big difference. I think it's, you know, the most important thing is to deal with the inside part of a person um, in their healing process. And it really shows, makes a big difference. Yes. Um, Andy, uh, for so many times, and for so many time, um, my mother and my father, they compare me, they compare me with other children. And now, sometimes I compare myself with others. Uh, what can I do to stop this? Well, it sounds like um, th that's something you've been exposed to for a long time. And so it's become a bad habit in a way. And it seems like you have been measuring yourself by comparing yourself to other people. And I think um, it's a matter of really realizing that you are unique, there's nobody else like you, and that the real measure of your worth and your growth even is not in comparison to others, but just compared to how you've been in the past. And if you're making good choices, and are living a good life, you know, be kind to yourself. It's time to forgive, to forgive yourself for even swallowing that as a kid, you know, the, that you compare yourself to others, you know, that turns into self-punishment. That's, it's just not being a friend to yourself. So make the fundamental choice to be a good friend to yourself and let yourself off the hook. Yes. Andy, uh, healing begins with our beliefs. Tell me more about this statement. You know, when, when, when we're born, we're like little babies who have no ideas about anything. All we do is feel things. When we're hungry, we feel hungry. When we're sad, we cry. We're very simple, very simple beings. But as we grow up, I guess you could say, we, we start absorbing from the environment ideas about who we are, what's right, what's wrong. And we will develop this system of beliefs within us. And not all of those beliefs are good or positive. In fact, I would say a lot of them are not only unhealthy, they're toxic. But it's not even that other people are doing it to us so much anymore we're doing it to ourselves because we swallowed them we swallowed these beliefs that really are have nothing to do with reality and so i mean if you're like me i need help freeing myself from this this whole system of beliefs and identity you know it's time for me to liberate my identity liberate myself from the identity that's been imposed upon me and I swallowed it, you know, it's not because I'm stupid, it's because I was innocent and didn't know better. So it takes some effort to free ourselves from beliefs. Even the positive ones can end up being limiting. You know, they just feed our ego or something. Yes. 
<laughs> what needs does a wife have? What a needs wife. does a Need. wife have? <laughs> yes, a, a wife. Oh my God, I'm I'm reflecting on my past marriages. <laughs> oh no, I'm having a past wife experience. Um, listen, I think the needs of a wife in a relationship are just like anybody's needs in a relationship. To be respected, to be seen, to be heard, to feel loved, um, good communication, acknowledgement. I mean, you know, adoration doesn't hurt. To feel yeah. adored, to feel celebrated, those are all... Those things make me feel good in relationship. Yes, yes. Andy, by what kind of mechanism people happen to stay in bad condition for a long time, health condition, bad health condition for a long time, without searching for uh, answers or help? What is the reason? Well, a lot of times um, it's simply ignorance. We just don't know that help might be available. And, uh, or we're scared to change our circumstances because it's too much of the unknown. And it really does involve trust. You know, there's lots of people out there saying, do what I tell you to do and I'll help you get well. And we have to, we have to pick and choose wisely. And so people, will stay sick rather than be self-responsible and make good choices or make informed choices because it's easier in some ways to be a victim, you know? And people will build an identity around their illness. Oh, I can't do that, I'm sick, you know? And then it's just easier. I mean, this doesn't sound like I'm being very nice, but I think people are pretty much lazy. You know, if it's too too much work, we're just not going to do it. And especially when it comes to change. Oh, my God. I see that at the Institute here all the time. People know this is helping them, and they still, they hold on to their old food habits just because it, it's such a challenge to change. And people feel like, oh, I have to give up this and give up that. That's why we provide psychological support, because people need help in changing even when the changes are for the better <laughs> yes i know you're laughing because we people are silly we're absurd in a lot yes. of ways yes because the people they pay so much money to be there and they are not able to able they are able but they don't want to do that see i know i know how if I have a little story. I worked with somebody once. They were sitting in my office and they were complaining about how difficult it is to change my lifestyle and everything, everything. And I finally just said, you know what? It sounds like you really don't want to do it. And they started laughing and they laughed for 20 minutes because it was true. They were complaining about it, this and that. But the bottom line is they just didn't want to do it. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Yes, yes, they didn't want it. Um, <clears throat> um, without working in the emotional level, just making changes in diet, uh, do you, uh, do people have changes in the healing anyway? I can heal myself if I only do changes in the diet? Yes, I've seen people make good progress just by changing the physical diet whether they do inner work or not but for many people and i'm going to say most people the the real obstacle to getting well are is an inner obstacle it's not just lifestyle related it's what they tell themselves it's how they feel about themselves it's settling for bad relationships doing work that they hate you know, this is, we're human beings. It isn't just, we're not robots. If you change our fuel, our physical fuel, everything will be better. You've got to deal with these human things. 
Yes, yes. Um, Andy, um, how can I do, uh, how can I get rid of the guilt? Because I have, I have some time guilt. I feel guilty but really? for what I did in the past. Really, tell me one thing you've done that you feel guilty. <laughs> oh, many, many. <laughs> but I have a friend that he did an abortion. <laughs> oh. Yes, and he now he feels guilty, and I can I don't know how can I help her. Um. You know, guilt really means that we have violated our own value system and we don't feel good about ourselves. We're, we actually have done something that makes us, that we're ashamed of. And I think in the beginning, you know, for me, other people forgiving me helps me forgive myself. So that can be an important step is to share these things with other people. And then when I see that they're not judging me so harshly like I'm judging myself, I'm more likely to soften. And also in terms of guilt, it, 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 can, it can mean it's time to make amends. That means you do something to say you're sorry, to correct what you've done wrong with the people that you've hurt. You know, this is a very intense story. In India years ago, the Muslims and the Hindus were fighting and there was a big riot. And some, I forget who did the violence to whom, but they were killing and hurting children of the other sect. And this man came into Mahatma Gandhi and he confessed, he said, I am so guilty. I actually murdered a little Muslim child and I can't live with myself. What should I do? And Gandhi said, you know, there are other children, Muslim children that have been orphaned because of this riot. Adopt one of them and raise it as your own kid. And so that was his living amends. He was not only sorry for what he did, but he, he it showed up in action. And yeah. that, was, that was brilliantly handled by Gandhi. I mean, goodness. Yes. So if somebody has an abortion and they feel guilty about it, it's it's helpful to go to support groups and to confess to somebody and talk it out, to hold it in privately and feel like crap is that's not healthy or help helping anybody. Yes. Why do people stay in a healthy relationship for a long time? Well, and do this relationship impact uh, their health? Oh, I mean, the second part of the question is yes, people get sick. Whenever you do stuff that you end up settling for less than something healthy, you will get sick. Um, people are who, who are in happy relationships live longer. It makes sense to conclude that people who are in unhappy relationships live shorter. And people stay in unhappy relationships for several reasons. They don't think they can do better. They, uh, they're just familiar with it. They don't want to change. You know, lots of, lots of reasons. That they're, they're in denial about the reality, the truth. And they don't think they can do better sometimes. Well, this is better than nothing. That's a really low bar. That's a low level of, ex of acceptance. Or some people, I've even seen people have spiritual reasons for staying in bad relationships. Well, I'm learning how to tolerate. <laughs> well, okay. I don't think that's biologically healthy. And I've seen it. That's why my book is all about telling the truth, you know? Jesus said, the truth shall set you free. But what he didn't say is it might make you really uncomfortable at first. And so, but it takes, a, it takes some practice. You start telling the truth and eventually you'll feel the benefits. It's like, okay, relief. Even thieves 
feel some relief when they finally get caught or they admit that they've done something wrong. There's a certain level of relief. Okay. Then they can begin to live an honest life. Tell me more about your book, about telling the truth. How can I tell only the truth? <laughs> because the it's truth. not easy to tell, tell only the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you, God. <laughs> That's so what they say. You the only, you only say the truth, ever, ever. Well, no, that would be a lie. <laughs> I, I do, I fudge things, but I'm more. I, I make it more of the, my intent to, to tell the truth. And I have to learn how to be comfortable with my own discomfort. Um, there are three levels of telling the truth. One is just the facts. The carpet is red. There's, that's not debatable. And if somebody debates that, well, you can verify that with science or something. The second level is how you feel about the truth. I don't like your red carpet. It clashes with all the furniture. And there's some risk involved in talking like that. Maybe your friend won't like you anymore. Oh, you don't like my carpet? I can't be your friend anymore. But that's not very risky. And mainly family and friends operate at that level of truth. I will tell you things and how I feel about them because I care about you and I want you to know. So that's a good level of truth. Okay, the third level of truth is that what I call confession. When I see your red carpet, I get uncomfortable because it's such a bold thing to do and it makes me feel like how timid and afraid I have been in my life. See, that's very vulnerable. That's self-revealing. And it's also not debatable because I'm telling you how I feel. But that's the level of truth where real closeness results from that. Real intimacy requires that level of truth. Vulnerability, self-revealing. That's the level of truth that makes the difference at a physical level. That's why the healing circle is so powerful. Because people get to that level. And we laugh together, we cry together. And people feel so relieved. They finally are telling the truth. Wow. Tell me the most beautiful story that you saw of transformation in the healing circle. You told me uh, one or two. You can tell me what what story do you want for, for the healing circle? Um, I told you the story about the Vietnam veteran, right? Yes, yes. So you don't want me to tell that story again. You can you can tell the story. Can tell that yes. one again. Well, let me yes. think. Maybe there's another one that's a little shorter. Um, uh, I can give you a really quick example. There was yes. uh, this woman with her was in the healing circle with her husband, and she was lying down. She was very weak. And she raised her hand and she said, I'd like to take my turn. And I said, why do you want to take your turn? She said, I've seen people get energy from, you know, when you work with them. And, I, and she said, I want some energy. And I said, okay, you want some energy. Um, let me see how it goes. So she said, uh, yeah, I, I want more spontaneity in my life and in my marriage relationship. And I said, okay, do something spontaneous right now. And so she reached out and she hit her husband. And, <laughs> and we all laughed. And I said, okay, that's spontaneous. How do you feel right now? And she started crying and she said, I want more spontaneity in our relationship. I missed that. I, I'm bored. She said that. And he started crying. And he said, oh, I don't do spontaneous things because I'm doing it out of respect for you because you're not feeling well. 
And she said, well, I miss you. And then he said, I miss you. And they started crying together. And wow. I said, how's your, I said, how's your energy right now? And she said, I'm on fire. You know, she sat up and was hugging him. And I said, see what you did. You started telling the truth and you did something spontaneous. And it was about you and your feelings. You know, you, you were like a victim of him. Look at what you just did and what you just made happen. And it was amazing. Her energy level went up. They were close together. I mean, it was amazing. And she learned that she didn't have to be a victim of anything. She made, took some action. Was it risky to say, oh, I'm bored with you? Yes. Yeah. Nobody likes to hear that. So that's yeah. a, that was a profound change that happened very quickly. Yes. What do you think, Andy, about fear of death? Because I saw so many people that are sick and they are fear of they have fear of death. What do you think about that? that? Um, I mean, I've experienced that myself just because it's just so unknown. It's just I can't imagine the world without me in it what does that even what does that mean i won't see anything i won't hear anything i won't feel anything so the fear of death is understandable but i also believe it comes from not knowing that inner thing that doesn't die once a person gets in touch with the spirit or whatever you call it then it's just a change. And you know, I'm getting older. I think about these things more, more and more really. So I, I practice getting in touch with that and, and letting go of my senses and withdrawing and going to that inner space. And it turns out that that space is really beautiful, that there's joy there, there's, that's independent of everything. And that's very different from just pleasure. You know, joy is not the same as pleasure. You know, things feel good and they taste good. Those are related to my senses. And if that's all I know, I will be afraid to lose all that. That makes sense. But if I know something else, I, I won't be so afraid. So there's no shortcut around that. You know, I can tell people the theory about life after death, you will go to heaven, but that doesn't that's just a story. And I personally, I don't take comfort in that so much. What I take comfort in is my own experience, that when I do withdraw my senses, there's something beautiful there. And that's where I'm going to go. That's what I really am. Mm -hmm. And you know what, I need to hear that a lot from people that are experiencing that. So I I choose my company and I, I get to hear that message. Yes. How does the capacity or incapacity to connect, uh, to connect uh, to oneself influence my health? If I can connect or I cannot connect with yeah. me? Well, listen, like I said, originally, we are naturally connected. When babies or children are sad, they cry. When we get older, we disconnect because for some reason in our environment, it's not safe to just feel what we feel. And we, we create a whole lifestyle of being disconnected and we create an identity of, of being a separate disconnected person. And does that affect your health? Yes, of course. That means once a person is disconnected, they will eat whether they are hungry or not. They will be in a relationship whether there is love or not. They will do work whether they appreciate it or are appreciated or not. People who are connected don't tolerate being disconnected. And so for many people, our tolerance level needs to go down. We tolerate too much garbage, too much stuff that doesn't work for us, that's not right. And so the process of getting connected, 
I, I mean, I think that's what therapy is all about. It's real therapy helps a person connect. Real meditation helps a person connect. Real relationship helps a person connect inside. It's all about connection. Disconnection, you want to you want to know the results of disconnection? Yeah. Take a look around at what's going on in the world. That's a symptom of being disconnected from reality. And it's it's terrible, it's ugly, it's ter terrifying. And so I'm going to do my part to be connected because I think I'm helping the whole world get connected with the truth, with reality. Not our differences, but what we have in common. And people need help connecting. And so that's not a crime or a sin. It's noble to make effort to connect, to connect inside, to connect at a heart level with other people. How do medical labor interfere with the capacity to heal? Because many people, they come at the Institute with, they know that when six or three months, they will die. So wait, what was your original question? How does the... How the medical labor interfere with the capacity, care. capacity to heal? You know what? One time, just for the fun of it, I wore a white lab coat to work. And people, <laughs> people who knew me laughed. But the people who didn't know me respected me more. I could say stuff and they listened better because I was wearing a white medical lab coat. Because we tend to believe doctors. We, we, we just tend to believe. And so the power of belief is so strong. So that when a doctor says you've got six months to live, often that will happen because they said so. And we just believe it, we take it right in. Wow. So, so it's important to challenge certain beliefs. And how you work? If, if I come and I work with you and, and I will tell you, the doctor told me that I will only have three months to live. I will, you know, I will bring a lot of evidence in to show that that's not necessarily true. I've been here for many, many years. I've seen people with the same diagnosis. They did this program and they lived way longer than three months or whatever you said the doctor told you. And I'll bring in that evidence. And then I'll say, you know what? Wouldn't it be cool to just prove the doctor wrong? You know, it's time to imagine yourself going into the doctor's office three years later and you throw the chart on the desk and say, see, you were wrong. Tap into the good feeling that would be. And people get inspired and they get pissed enough. Yeah, I'm not. And they, they make their own belief and they tap into being stubborn. You know, it's the people that are very compliant, who are very mild and accepting. They'll just accept whatever the doctor says because they're very nice people. You know, the people who do better are the people that are not so nice. They don't just accept and accommodate to whatever. They, they fight for their rights. They fight for their health. They're willing to make effort, not just accept, oh, the doctor said, I'm gonna die. I'm just gonna get ready to die. Mm -hmm. it's, it doesn't have to be that way, but they have to find resources within themselves to to find the fire and the strength to challenge that kind of a belief. You know, the doctors just work on statistics. You know, their doctors aren't necessarily evil people. In their experience, that, that statistic might be true. You've got three to four months to live. But they don't know people, that's based on people who don't do healthy lifestyles. That statistic is based on people that eat lousy and are in unhappy relationships and all that stuff. You correct those inner qualities and correct your lifestyle, you're outside of those medical statistics. I see that all the time here at Hippocrates. People who do this program are consistently outside the curve of medical statistics. That's just fact. 
good news, it's fact. Yeah. How what we swallow affect us? Do you mean you mean food or do you mean ideas? Food, ideas, uh, what we drink, all. Well, here's the simple reality. You are what you eat. If you eat garbage, you're going to get sick. And that's true at all those levels. If you eat, if you swallow all kinds of negative beliefs about yourself, about the world, it's going to weigh heavy on your heart and make you sick. Um, if you are in the presence of people that are mean and you know emotionally difficult people, that's going to, if you take that in, that's not a good diet. That's not a good emotional diet. If you're mean to yourself, that's not a good diet either. You're just feeding yourself bad things. So yes, at all levels, eating bad, swallowing bad things makes it bad for a person. And sometimes when a person's getting well, they not only have to stop putting bad things in, but they need to cleanse their system with colonics, throwing up, I mean, all kinds of things. I see people when they, and I'm pointing back there because that's where the client sits. <laughs> but when they start facing things, it's not uncommon for people when they're reviewing their history to get nauseous. Mm -hmm. And I say, I have a little plastic bucket. If you need to throw up, go for it. Mm -hmm. Because they're getting in touch with these ideas and things that they swallow that just aren't good for them. Purging is part of getting well, physically, emotionally, spiritually, conceptually. And the good news is, it's something we people can do. We're not doomed because we swallowed a bunch of bad things. We just start doing it right and then cleanse whatever, you know, whatever it was. How do childhood tra trauma um, determine our ability to take care of our health and how can we change that? You know, um, I think we talked about this a little earlier, but there are many people who believe that things are pretty much the foundation of the psyche is set in by the time you are seven years old. That means your belief about yourself, how you feel about yourself, conclusions about what you deserve and don't deserve, those are already set in there. And does that affect us? Yes, it totally affects the quality of our life for the rest of years, because we're not even aware that those things are why we believe the way we believe. We just think that's the way it is. We don't even know that our beliefs are just beliefs. And so, it takes a lot of love and it takes a lot of courage and it takes a lot of help and support to challenge those things. That's like lifting the house off the foundation and replacing that foundation with a whole new foundation and then you lower the house back down. The good news is people do that with real houses. These days they, they have the ability to lift the house. and You can do foundation work and then you put the the framework and the everything else back down on a new foundation or a repaired foundation. The same thing is true with people. It's just possible. And it takes work, it takes people who know what they're doing, it takes a lot of support, and it takes a lot of willingness. To be lifted off your foundation, that can feel really scary at first. Yes. Yeah. If I have the feeling, if I know that I I was not a good mother, what can I do to repair the relationship with my daughter? You need to buy her a new car every year. <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. I, I mean, you know, make amends. That means apologize. Uh, offer to go to therapy with her. Mm -hmm. 
And I would even say more importantly is to get to the point where you can realistically and actually forgive yourself. Because if the hook of guilt is in there, your daughter will play on that consciously or unconsciously. And she will be more of a victim in her life and not take self-responsibility. I'm not saying you didn't do bad things. If you did, you are guilty. But to stay in jail for a crime that you did a long time ago, that's not helping anybody. So you do your best to get out of jail. Say you're sorry. Be committed to never doing it again. And, and help them get well. Help them become self-responsible by taking your guilt out of their life. Beautiful. What is the fastest way to heal childhood trauma? Oh, you're asking some big questions, aren't you? <laughs> Listen, for me, it's definitely been therapy. That's been the fastest way and the safest way. Because if I'm not healing it directly, I'm acting it out indirectly in my relationship life with other people. And so I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to hurt other people just because I got hurt when I was a kid. I want to deal with it directly. And so I've, I've done a lot of therapy and I am involved in a group of people that does therapy together. And, you know, it's a, I'm a work in progress. And uh, there is a certain point where I believe I've reached critical mass where I'm not just a mess anymore. There, I've cleared a lot of the mess out and I get to be a, a happy human being, free from the hurts that I've collected over the years. And so it is a process, you know, if you're asking for a shortcut, I don't know any shortcuts. Feeling it and dealing with it is the shortcut. Yeah. What do you think about, I know I have, I know a woman that did 14 years, 40 years of a diet. I know women that all, they are always in diet. What is the reason that maybe they cannot lose weight? Because a diet, the way you're describing it, is like from the conscious mind. And that's like, this is a metaphor, but if a child falls down and hurts their knee and they're crying, and you write them a check, it's not the right approach. That doesn't soothe or comfort the child. And generally people that have a, an issue with food, it is something at a kid level. And so when they come up with a program that's just a diet, they end up making themselves feel worse because they can't stick to it. Oh, I'm not strong enough. I don't have a willpower. I'm a bad person. It's important to actually change one's relationship with food, not just change what you eat. And that, that really, most people have an emotional relationship with food. We go to food for comfort. We go to food to celebrate. We go to food when we don't feel good. We have an addictive relationship with food. And as long as that's there, you can, you, we will apply it in whatever diet we're in. I see people do that here at the Institute. People have the same unhealthy relationship with really healthy food. And it's, it doesn't, it doesn't, they don't change that much. They don't, even physically, they don't lose weight that much. What can we do to change the relationship with food? Well, when I work with somebody, I will have them think about what is a healthy relationship with food. Then you write it down and then I'll help you revise it. And then we'll get together in a group and the whole group of people will come up with 
what's a really good definition of a healthy relationship with food? And then I'll say, do you choose that? Is that your choice to have a healthy relationship with food? Define the way we defined it. And once a person says, yes, then things can change. But until that, people are just changing what they eat. It's like one dirty hand trying to clean the other dirty hand. If they haven't made the fundamental choice, the secondary choices never add up. You can do it for 40 years and it makes no difference. They're not getting to the root of what they're using food for. They're using food to emotionally comfort themselves. Get to that and all the rest of it falls into place much more easily. That and practicing good habits. Somebody who's on a diet, will main, they will hold on to their deprivation and they're just good at depriving themselves of what they really want. That never lasts, it never works because we don't do deprivation successfully. That's why I see when people here, they have this aha realization. Oh, when I eat this kind of healthy food, I'm not depriving myself, I'm doing something good for myself. When that mindset changes, everything changes. What do you think about the people that stick food dead at the in the institute? They they bring uh, they bring some food that is not healthy. What they what is the reason they did do they did that? Generally, it's because they relate to this program as if it's somebody else's rules that they have to follow, and they're they're just being like teenagers or stubborn little children it's like you can't tell me what to do <laughs> and if you have a if you have that dynamic with your health program you will never it will never work because you will always be fighting it because it's somebody else telling you what to do the real change happens here when people make this their own i'm choose this because it's good for me and i love myself everything else they will rebel against We've had people order pizza yeah. on campus. Yeah. That's ridiculous. They're what? They're hurting us? They're... Mm. Yes. A friend with cancer, he did this. He ordered pizza. Well, it's because the, the child part of them wants to be treated. You know, they want to treat. And so... It's the same what you would do with real children. You would find healthy things to treat them with. You wouldn't give, I wouldn't give a kid sugar, for instance. I would give them something else. You know, in the beginning, I would give them fruit or something. <laughs> but I'd come up with some treat that, that's healthy. Why did you choose a vegan diet, um, Andy? You know, when I first started working here, I was a vegetarian and there's a whole story behind that. But I, I went all the way to vegan because I saw what happens to the people who do it. I saw people get well that I didn't think could get well. And that was so compelling to me. I said, all right, I'm gonna do it. And also, when I had my live blood analysis done, you know, Anna Maria here, she looked at my blood and she said, are you, are you eating goat cheese? And I said, how in the world would you know that? And she said, yeah, it's this ring right around your blah, 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 your red blood cell here. And I said, if it shows up in my blood and it looked like the cell was being suffocated, that was, Good. That was information enough for me. It's like, no, I don't want to choke myself. And I can't hide the fact that I was eating goat cheese. She saw it. So, 
it's like, okay, I'm just coming clean here. I'm going to admit. Fear creates disease. What do you think about this statement? Well, fear is, you know, we didn't make it up. We're hardwired to have a fear response so that when something dangerous is happening, that we will be afraid of it. It's a survival mechanism. But to have fear, to be in a fearful state is not sustainable. That's the emergency response of our body. We can't be in emergency mode all the time. That will wear us down. Our, our um, stress response will be so high. Um, our stress hormone, our cortisol levels will be so high that it will wear us down. We will get sick from holding fear in our body. So people who are in a war zone or who are in a repressive regime or something like that, they're in a fear, sorry. They're, they're in a fear response that, that's actually unhealthy for them. And some people carry fear from their own past in the form of anxiety. Anxiety is fear about the future based on the past. That's my definition of anxiety. And so it goes back to those people need to do some inner work to free themselves. They're protecting themselves from something that already happened. I mean, you know, there's a difference between being careful and being fearful. Inner work can unburden people from stuff like that. Yes. Tell me more about your two books, please. All right. So we'll start with start with my first book. This is Deep Feeling, Deep Healing, The Heart, Mind, and Soul of Getting Well. This book, I originally wrote this one mainly for therapists. But then while I was writing it, I thought, you know what? I don't want it to be just for therapists. I want to demystify therapy for people who are interested in healing and getting well. But the focus is still a lot on therapy. My next book, Get Real, Get Well, I do tell a lot of therapy stories in there, but it's mainly of how you can apply the honesty principle in your everyday life, that it's important to get to that third level of confession and have close people and be connected with yourself. That is the main ingredient to being healthy as a human being. So that's what the focus on my second book is all about. If I don't let myself to feel, I can heal? Well, it's not making it easier for yourself. It's like dragging something out. It's like being mad at somebody and you don't really tell them, but you're not nice to them. And eventually they will say, are you mad at me? Right? Why don't you just say it right away? So I'm using that as a metaphor. It's like, it's important to just feel. Feeling is more original. It's more authentic. It's more real. Because there's so many people that try and be nice people. And I mean, nice is nice, but eventually if, if somebody's angry or somebody's upset, it will leak out. If, you know, people, we're not stupid. We will feel it. Some people are better at hiding their feelings than others. And that doesn't make them a better person. It just makes it more difficult to be with them in a way. One, uh one more question what can i do uh, for my child the most important thing that i like a mother can i give to my child the most important thing to really find inner happiness yourself and then you model that you share it finding any inner happiness for yourself is good for everybody around you especially your children because they look to you for guidance, for being a role model, for all of that. 
It's just the best thing. Start wherever you are. Start telling the truth a little deeper. Start being more intimate, even with your child. In my book, in this book, I talk about, um, you know, we save deep truth telling for memorial services. Like after a person's dead, we say such beautiful things about them. You know, oh, they meant so much to me. It's like, why don't we do that with people while we're alive, while they're alive? And so I challenge people in the book, say something today to somebody that you would say about them at their memorial service. Say it directly to them. It'll blow your mind. And your heart might beat a little quicker just while you're saying it, if you're not used to it. It's just a good thing to take it up a level. Take up the truth. I want to live in the truth. I want to be good friends with the truth. I don't want to be scared of the truth. That's not a good relationship. And it's okay to tell to my child what I did wrong. I did wrong this and I did wrong this with you. And I'm sorry about that. Yes, I think that's appropriate at any age. Because you will show up as a human being. Because if you if you hit your kid when they were three, it's important that they get the message, you know, what I did was wrong. I was frustrated. I didn't know what else to do. But not to focus just on the explanations, but on the actual apology and the actual acknowledgement that what I did was wrong. And I'm really sorry I did it. Then the, that goes in. If you can help that go in to a person, they will not feel so bad. Children conclude that whatever happens to me, I deserve it. So I remember when my father hit me, I thought, oh God, I deserve it. I didn't even know exactly what I did, but I, I just believed I must deserve it. It's my father. He's hitting me. It's only later on that I realized that he was just frustrated and didn't know what to do and was angry and he was worried about me or whatever his reasons were. That just wasn't the right way to show it. And he never apologized. Mm -hmm. So while you're alive and while the kid is alive, clean it up, why not? Beautiful. It was a pleasure to have you here, Andy. Thank, Thank you. you.